Welcome everyone to our Reframing Fresh monthly webinar series with New Day Films. We want to give a big welcome um, to our panelists um, who you are about to meet. Uh, a little bit later on, we have Victor Ilyukin, we have Olga Livoff, we have Kimi Takasue, and we have Kelly Anderson who are going to be taking us through this conversation about film and mental health and all these wonder inner workings of the mind. Um, so welcome, we're so grateful that you're with us today. Without further ado, um, I'll get our program started today. Um, my name is Larissa Lamb and I'm a member owner of New Day Films. I'm also the director of a film called Far East Deep South about the early Chinese in Mississippi during segregation. First, I just wanna tell you a little bit more about New Day. We are um, a filmmaker com community that's very unique. We are a filmmaker run distribution cooperative that has been providing award-winning films to educators, community groups, government agencies, public libraries, and businesses since 1971. So we are celebrating over 50 years. We're democratically run by more than 150 filmmaker members and New Day is committed to reflecting greater diversity representation and inclusion and New Day Films has been broadcast have broadcast on PBS HBO and other media outlets um, some of the things that we're very proud to say is that in our 50 years um, one of our founders is actually uh, Julia Reichert um, who won the Oscar uh, for best documentary for American Factory a, a couple years ago um, and most recently um, one of our members is uh, Reed Davenport who just picked up the documentary directing award at Sundance last week. Um, so we're very, very proud of all the different filmmakers that are, have been part of New Day over the years and are currently still part of New Day. And let me introduce um, our moderator for this morning or afternoon, depending on where you're coming in from, um, Kelly Anderson. Um, Kelly Anderson is a professor of film and media studies at Hunter College in New York City. She is also an award-winning filmmaker whose works have screened at major film festivals like Sundance and Tribeca, and her films have aired on PBS and HBO. Her films include Unstuck and OCD kids movie about six kids with OCD as they share how they learn to face their fears. And her other films are My Brooklyn, which broadcast on PBS World Series, America Reframed, and Every Mother's Son, which was nominated for a national Emmy for directing. Um, please welcome Kelly Anderson. Thank you so much, Larissa. Um, and thanks everyone for coming. I'm so happy to be uh, facilitating this conversation with my New Day colleagues, uh, Victor Ilukin. Olga Lavoff and Kimi Takesue. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Victor and Olga first, and we'll look at the trailer for their film, Busy Inside, and then I'll um, introduce you to Kimi. So Victor is a nonfiction producer. Victor, can you put your camera on? Um, he's worked internationally in documentary for more than 10 years. He was on the producing team of Elephant Path, uh, which was on PBS World and Al Jazeera and also on the producing uh, team for Welcome to Chechnya, which premiered at the Sundance Film Festival in 2020 and was acquired for broadcast by HBO. And Olga Lavoff, um, her previous work includes a documentary titled When People Die, They Sing Songs, which was broadcast on NHK in Japan, theatrically released in Russia, and in festivals around the world, including Doc NYC right here in New York. It was nominated for a student Oscar, um, which is amazing. So today we're going to be talking about their newest film. It's called Busy Inside, and it's about several women with dissociative identity disorder. Uh, this film premiered at the Moscow International Film Festival and uh, was also on PBS World. And I was amazed to read that it was released theatrically in Russia in over 30 theaters. And in some of those theaters, it ran for three months. So I definitely wanna to talk to you about why the film uh, was so popular with audiences there. So let's go ahead and just look at a, a one minute trailer from Busy Inside. You guys all know life the way you know life. We know life the way we do. The ones inside call me the face person. See him here? This is the monster that keeps coming up. I treat people who are living with multiple personality disorder. How old are you? I'm eight. I'm 28. I'm eight. I wasn't focused on being a mom. I wasn't a very good mom. 
Happiness is just the color of the day. I just couldn't fathom it. We're not lonely. It's busy inside. Great, thank you for that. Um, so Victor and Olga, I, I learned so much from your film. You know, what I knew about uh, dissociative identity disorder was from reading this book, Sybil, that was very popular like about 30 years ago. And, and I thought I had even heard that, um, well, this used to be called multiple personality disorder, right? And I thought that I had even read that some therapists didn't believe that this existed anymore. So I, I would love it if you could just tell us a little bit about how you came to be making this film. Um, and a little bit the story of, of the film's making. Of course, uh, happy to share that story. We've been friends with Victor for many years. We always loved psychology and reading books about it and giving to each other. And Victor gave me the book, told me about the book called Multiple Minds of Billy Milligan, about the first case where their multiple personality disorder was recognized in court. And um, he told me about the disorder. It's a documentary book where it's described very well how it's happening and why and mechanism. And I couldn't believe it. Uh, I literally thought that um, I will never believe it. It's one of those uh, mystical things that, you know, some people might, but I will never uh, buy into it. And then I still read the book and uh, it's so well written um, that I could visually see. And I understood very well the, the mechanism of the disorder and I was so impressed that I it could it never left my mind. And I, you know, since that time, I, it, in in uh, a few years, I started making the film. But it uh, had an uh, enormous eff um, effect on me. Victor, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think I, I just we just also got very lucky because uh, Olga met uh, the main character. Karen um, Marshall, who is a therapist, and you know, it's very rare to get access to therapy sessions and to witness uh, patients with DID and how they come to terms with the diagnosis, because for most of them, it's like um, a, a surprise in life and a big crisis. Uh, so, but uh, she, she wrote a book amongst ourselves. It's like a self guide to help people um, you know, diagnose the ID and come to terms with it. And um, also uh, she just let us in, in her world. And uh, she has this condition herself and uh, she created this very friendly environment for people to share their stories. And she was leading a support group for women in San Diego, California, uh, where we met our second character, Marche, and witnessed their beautiful relationship and how they help each other understand you know how to live um, the way they do with friendly families of uh, personalities inside you know i wanted to add to that that um when i'm usually searching for for a film subject and uh, this is to our conversation film and mind and how they are related and how we can show it on screen when i was reading the book i could see the film there i could see that it's a visual story it requires a medium film which you know in which has a time and with only with time you can share um the experience and you and uh, um really what's going on with these people so i was thinking if we could if we could find people who really uh change and you can see it in their faces what's happening um film is an amazing medium and maybe the only one that can really um, show what's going on. Because sometimes, you know, when I go through subjects, when I work on the, the next story, so many stories can be books or can be art, long articles. And I always think, why film? Why this can be a film? Why this requires a film, you know? Great. Yeah. Listening to you, I'm, I'm reminded of one of the scenes at the very end of the film where you invite the different personalities that are inside Karen to introduce themselves. And it's a very intense moment and there's no cutting away to anything. So just within this one frame and one time, you actually see, see them and they, some of them, not all of them come out and actually um, introduce themselves. It's, um, 
it's it's pretty amazing to experience that. And I also felt that your film was incredibly, uh, they must have really trusted you. I felt the film was very um, generous and, and accepting in its in its representation. Um, so yeah, definitely worth worth looking at. Let me um, let me bring Kimi into the conversation. Um, so Kimi Takesue is a professor at Rutgers University in the Department of Art, Culture, and Media. Her films, which explore complex dynamics of cross-cultural encounters, have been featured at over 250 film festivals. That's an amazing number, including Sundance and South by Southwest. She's received Guggenheim and Rockefeller fellowships. And uh, we're going to be looking today at her film, Rosewater, which is a short film about a solitary man's struggle to cultivate beauty in a desolate post-apocalyptic world. Um, and it does feel lately like we're living in a bit of an apocalyptic world, actually. Um, so this film, I'm really glad that the programmers put these two films together because they really show the breadth of the New Day collection and the ways that different types of film can work with different audiences. So let's look at the trailer for Rosewater and then we'll speak with Kimi a little bit. beautiful film. Kimi, um, you're releasing this film now, um, even though it's a film that you completed a while ago. And I remember you saying that it really felt um, of the moment right now um, because of the, the various things that we're going through um, culturally and as a society. So maybe you could talk about how you see the film meeting this moment. Um, yeah, and sure. yeah. Mm -hmm. First of all, I'm sorry the sound didn't come through. Um, effectively there. So I hope you still got a kind of a sense of, of, of the soundscape. But, you know, the film is, um, it is about this, this lonely and solitary man who is literally, he's, he's trying to grow a rose in this, you know, desolate kind of post-apocalyptic world. But, you know, it's really a film that is about someone who is, is struggling with loneliness and trying to find connection and you know is trying to kind of find some beauty in his life and is you know experiencing a lot of anxiety and ultimately trying to find some sense of well-being and so um yeah i did make this film a number of years ago and it it, it circulated and um but now you know people were encouraging me to kind of release this again at this moment because i, I never really thought about it in the context of like mental health um, but it really does have so much like resonance now because so many people are struggling in such fundamental ways with these, you know, issues of isolation and feeling disconnected and, and wanting to reach out and just a lot of like underlying anxiety, um, you know, about the world. And I think particularly with young people and, you know, where there's just so much uncertainty right now. 
And uh, this film can perhaps become a way to enter into some of those, you know, conversations and, and sort of difficult feelings. And I think, you know, there's some other ways in which the film I think is a little bit of the moment too that I hadn't thought as much about earlier and that just in the way that it's too um, looks at gender roles and sort of uh, notions of Asian masculinity and kind of like how, uh, how one can expose their vulnerabilities, particularly for like Asian men and, um, and also just on a kind of an environmental level, which I really hadn't thought of earlier in the sense of climate change and the, the idea that now we're in this world of such scarcity and kind of, you know, this idea of this man trying to grow the, this rose in this barren, like desolate landscape kind of has a new meaning to it. And I think that the idea that we're not only kind of um, having difficulty with connection with people, but we're also just this idea of like connecting with nature as well. So those are some of the ways that I feel like I, I, I've kind of come to, um, you know, appreciate the film in new ways at this moment. Great. Um, maybe this would be a good time to bring in the trailer for Unstuck, which is the film that I made um, with uh, Chris Bear about um, kids and obsessive compulsive disorder. So um, if we could show that trailer, it's another New Day film. My therapist showed me an island. And my island was like invisible. And OCD is now, and it's like the world. I just kept thinking, like, I'm crazy, no one knows what I'm going through. Like, in school, if I wrote like a story or like an essay or something, I'd feel like I needed to like erase it and then rewrite the whole thing. And then I'd like stay after class trying to erase it and write it, erase it and write. I just had a bad feeling that something would happen because I didn't read the tag on my clothes in a certain amount of times. My parents didn't know it was OCD, so they thought it was just me being like disobedient. It was also very hard when you were kind of a little afraid of me. I had a feeling we were going to see a psychologist. We did these things like hierarchies. You would list all the things that were giving you trouble. You write them all down and then we do different exposures for it. Watch video clips of superheroes, watch movie with superhero, dress like a superhero, wear a Hulk mask. They had me write curse words in the Bible. Exposures are like challenges. Sometimes when I tell people I have OCD, they're like, oh, I have it too. I just like, I in my house, I just like to have everything clean. I just look at them like, you don't understand. I can take a shower. I can wash my hands. I can read a book. So I made that film. It's a um, like short film. I think it's about, I forgot how long it is. I think it's about 20 minutes. And um, I made it uh, because I was the parent of a child with obsessive compulsive disorder and um, found that uh, a lot of parents, you know, I was in a um, support group and there were really not many resources at all. Um, and we were all finding ourselves in a, a crisis really. Um, and then, we had discovered that there was a particular therapy that works really well with OCD. It's called exposure and response prevention, but a lot of people didn't know about it. So that's why we decided to um, make the film and, and really um, through the process of having our kids in this uh, group therapy together doing OCD exposure therapy um, and sort of confronting the things that they're super afraid of. Um, uh, we realized that kids talking to other kids was really powerful and that when grownups talk to kids, a lot of times they don't really, they tune out and they don't trust it. Um, but when kids talk to each other, 
Um, so we found that you know, lots of therapists have used the film um, as a way to encourage kids to engage in exposure therapy, which is really very scary. Um, uh, and also, um, so yeah, it's, it's used a lot by therapists. It's also used in um, colleges, universities, and psychology programs. Um, and it's all, we also just wanted to dispel this idea of OCD just being about being a neat freak or something, because um, that's something that really robes people in the community the wrong way. Um, so yeah, so that's the film. Um, and happy to answer any questions about it. But to start out the conversation, um, I guess I wanted to get uh, at that sort of um, connection and, and this idea of starting conversations with films. Um, and I wanted to know if all of you or any of you wanted to talk about what your goals were for impacting an audience. Um, who were you speaking to? And how have, your, have, how have you seen your film work with audiences, uh, particular audiences? So who's coming to see it? Um, you know, why were people in Russia so excited about the film? Um, you know, who else has been big fans of, of any of your films um, and why? Yeah, how's it working? <laughs> well, I, I can say that, um, you know, with my film, it, it's, it's, it's more of an impressionistic film, you know, and it's operating in more of a poetic register. So it, it really is very open to interpretation. And I am delving into kind of the interior world of this man and like really exploring his sort of emotional landscape through a uh, visual storytelling and through sound. Like there's no language in my film, there's no dialogue. So it really is kind of like diving into his subconscious and into his dreamscape. And um, it's very kind of associative and imagery. So there's a lot of space, you know, in the film for the viewer to interpret. So that's one of the things that I enjoy about it is it's kind of the unpredictability too of what you know, a viewer might get from the film. So I think that, you know, it, it, it really has kind of different points of entry for people. And to me, it's like, my hope is that with the film that, you know, it invites some kind of self-reflection and invites some kind of contemplation and sort of resonates afterwards, but that there are these kind of different points of entry and that, 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 you know, uh, people can sort of appreciate it on different levels, but they're really sort of, uh, they need to be a participant in the film because it does require this kind of active engagement to sort of read the film, you know, because it, it certainly is not just sort of explicit, like what it's about. So uh, for me, it really is about like uh, people engaging and, and um, being exposed to maybe something that's, that's different and sort of what that, you know, uh, elicits for them. Thanks, Victor and Olga. Yeah, I would say uh, two things come to mind. First, that uh, obviously the you know our the people who are in the film they agreed to um, to be there because they wanted to help other people with mental illnesses and with uh, DID dissociative identity disorder to feel normal, and that's what they told us um it was very hard for them to open up it's still very hard for um, all of them to watch the film but they um understand the purpose very clearly and i think that's what helped us to get them on board and in terms of the audiences that's what the audiences see we've got we've had uh, mm, dozens of people i think commenting both after their theatrical releases uh, in uh, russia and also after pbs release here in america um, sending us uh, letters that they have it or their relatives have it and it helps them to first uh, see themselves th themselves in media not stigmatized and not um, like this crazy horror horrific people but people living normal lives and uh, having friends uh, work being loved that it's all possible and uh, that there is healing and there's hope um, but also uh, on the other hand I would say general audiences uh, enjoy the film because that was also my directorial impulse when um, when I myself was so intrigued by the subject I really was thinking that 
this uh, disorder, just like a magnifying glass, shows us what the human psyche is and what it can do. Because it's a healthy, healthy brain of a child when the child is born and being treated very badly and uh, goes through trauma many times, horrific traumas. Um, this is a coping mechanism. And um, this for me just shows how our brain is able, capable to dissociate when uh, they, when it's a survival survival technique and we all do it to some extent um or when we you know the traumatic experiences is, is hard to process process um so for me it's discovering what human being is and what what we all are and you know who we are and what our identity consists of and i think this really speaks to very very general audiences and to anyone who is interested in humans and in brain function and in just, uh, you know, how we live here. Yeah, that's what I was referring to earlier is the sense that you're not othering, you know, the subjects in the film that it, it, we're very much encouraged to see ourselves in them. Um, and it sort of is a way of um, creating empathy and um, sort of not um, having this binary between like you know, normal and abnormal, but to actually sort of see that we're all in this world together. Um, even with the OCD kids, you know, we always felt like, um, you know, it could be presented very sensationally, um, this exposure therapy thing, you know? Um, and in fact, we don't show the kids going through exposure therapy. We have the, we decided to position the kids as experts. Uh, and, and really um, narrate their own stories um, from a position of strength and expertise. And, um, and so we did that as a way to try not to sort of, you know, sensationalize, but to really um, allow people to see not only their story, but sort of the value of fighting, you know, I mean, everybody faces fear um, and has to deal with confronting those fears in some ways. So, you know, navigating that, um, that balance, I think, is always, um, it's challenging in the mental health space, definitely. And Kelly, I'm just curious also about your film, like uh, how you decided and uh, how you worked on, you know, showing this through the kids' perspective. Could you talk a little bit about it? Yeah, I had wanted to make a film about it just because there was this, un I mean, being the parent of a child with OCD is a very challenging situation. I mean, it's more challenging for the kids, but it's, it's very challenging and usually happens between age like nine and 12 when it first happens, when it first comes on. And um, so just being in these parent groups and realizing support groups and realizing that there was just no film out there and being a filmmaker, I, I wanted to do something, but I, I felt like I didn't want to sensationalize because there actually is a show on television about um, OCD. It's, um, I think it's called Obsessed. It's about adults and it, it's a reality show where it shows them going through exposure therapy. And I, I did not want to do that at all, um, but I wanted to do something. And then I actually saw a film by another filmmaker in our co-op, which is, uh, it, it was Ellen Bruno's film Split, which is about divorce and kids, which is another great film that deals with the psychological subject. And it's all told in the voices of kids. And so I was like, wow, that's interesting. And it started percolating. And then the kids went to this group together um, where they were doing these exposures in, in a group setting and they would support each other. They were working with this wonderful therapist at Mount Sinai Hospital here in New York. And I was driving two of the kids home, my, my child and another one. And I heard them talking in the back seat of the car and they sounded like little therapists. You know, They were like, what was the hardest you know, what was the, the biggest thing that OCD ever kept you from doing that you wanted to do? You know, they were sort of like chatting back and forth. And I said, oh, wow, this is actually like they know about this, you know, so um, that's that's how we decided. So it was like a fear of sensationalizing and um, and exploiting and also um, a recognition of just how much they were able to talk about what they did. And it was very um, 
empowering for them because we partnered with the OCD, uh, International OCD Foundation, and we did a keynote event for their conference. And this is a conference where every researcher and family member and people with OCD, everybody gathers once a year. This was pre-pandemic. And they showed the film, we premiered it at their annual conference in San Francisco and 800 people were there and did a standing ovation for the kids and the kids came and they were on a panel, you know, and they were only 11, 12, 13 years old, you know, so they became these spokespeople and they did quite a lot of speaking with the film and that again reinforced their, you know, fight against OCD as well. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I just want to follow up on that. I, I was really struck by that aspect of your film in the sense of like, how intelligent and thoughtful the kids are you know they were really like it, it it was very sort of inspirational and even when they talked about you know exposures and how they're sort of tackling sort of one beat at a time whatever it is that they're struggling with it was it was very inspirational because we all struggle right with with challenges and fears and everything and i found myself like really looking to them as sort of uh, role models and inspiration of, of like how to, you know, I have to sort of do these exposures for myself, you know, um, for things that, that, that I struggle with. So I was really impressed with them. Well, thank you. And speaking of how film works, I think the filmmaking process for people who are in films, it's also, you know, telling your own story is also incredibly um, powerful. So yeah, now, um, did any of you all partner with organizations to get the film out into the world? And um, curious about that, what kind of partnerships with people outside of the film world you might have done? Yeah, again, my, my film is, is, you know, it's a fiction film and, and it, it's really cool to kind of see new applications in the sense that as filmmakers, we often have kind of a limited sense of what one's film is. And I think when you look at it in the educational context, the idea, as I said before, like I never really thought about it framed in the context of mental health, but like, wow, with COVID and the pandemic, it's completely, it's completely relevant. And it's a, it's a way, right? When it's something that's fiction too, I, I think there are a lot of ways that someone who is struggling can uh, enter into the conversation and bring some of their experiences and perspectives, but they're not singled out too. And they're not, you know, so it's kind of like a safe space to um, start engaging in some of those, uh, you know, issues, um, but not kind of be named. So, and like I said, in terms of the environmental context or, you know, uh, just, just other ways into the film. I mean, it's kind of, this is the moment when I'm sort of looking at it in that way, because it had been sort of looked at more in a traditional film festival context and used maybe more within film courses, especially for like, you know, film classes that are dealing with cinematography and dealing with, um, uh, composition or like uh, soundscapes, for example, because all the, the sound is, is it's, it was all shot on 16 millimeter and uh, it's async sound. So the entire sound is, you know, scape is created. Um, so it's like a good example of that kind of filmmaking. So yeah, for me, um, it, it, I've never worked with organizations, but it, it, it'd be interesting if, I don't know, maybe, maybe there'll be some possibilities at this point. What about you, you two? Um, you know, I wanted to add that uh, similarly, uh, like Kimi was surprised. Uh, we, when uh, we had our PBS release, um, we had an article written in the New York Times on the health section about the film and about the disorder. And it actually started a huge wave of comment. Um, it almost seemed like it's a, it's a whole new discussion happening. Uh, hundreds, hundreds of comments and people arguing, arguing with each other of how sh this shall be treated or how these people are looked at in society and so on and so forth. And we were very happy to see that we were really able to start a conversation. Again, maybe it was already, you know, uh, it was previously started when uh, there were old films like Three Faces of Eve or Sybil and so on. But here is a real story. Um, documentary, a very different thing with, um, uh, you know, in the current world, uh, how many years passed, you know, uh, how many years passed from this point from Three Faces of Eve? Is it a 50s film or something like that? And uh, still, 
there are so many disbeliefs and so many stigmas and so many similar, sometimes even the same, you know, the same views that um, it was surprising. And I'm happy that uh, our film is working uh, to educate as well, you know, here and shows what, what it really looks like, what it's not, not, a non, not in a not a fictional story. Yeah, mm -hmm. I just wanted to add that we've got many reactions like from therapists um, and their patients who watch the film and um, it's usually uh, a really good reaction because they say now we can actually show how our patients feel like or how we feel like or that we are not alone. And I think for us, like the, also one of the goals of making the film and getting it out there was to kind of uh, because uh, one of our characters in the film, she says, like, everyone has struggled with something, right? Especially now in this challenging time, the depression and the isolation and anxiety. And, uh, and, you know, it's easy to feel like lonely or that you are against all odds uh, just by yourself. Uh, but actually there is like psychology of our minds give us so many coping mechanisms and uh, um, solutions that we could we could find and the help is there and you know and it's inside too and um, our resources uh, are remarkable that people are uh, can rely on within themselves like uh, uh, one of our main characters Marche she has different personalities and of course you know with people with multiple personalities with DID, some personalities can be really um, aggressive or even suicidal uh, and you have to deal with those and the therapy of course but there are the ones that are uh, beautiful and have different talents and hers are were a singer one is a singer and another one is a dancer another one is a really good artist and uh, just uh, you know meeting all of them and seeing how they they uh, communicate and also um, how they they uh, develop a strategy to become uh, brave together, sort of, and uh, uh, they, you know, they rehearsed the songs, they uh, did a public performance for the first time and they witnessed it, like all of it for me, and uh, luckily <laughs> it came through, uh, just uh, shows us like how much is inside to deal with fear and um, so like if, if it is like if a film could be a beautiful metaphor of this that would for us as a filmmaker is that like the main the main, the main reward uh but right now i see that you know it's on it's on canopy and uh, many many universities are using it um and uh, students and professors watching and so it could be an impact in this discussion about healing and trauma that would be also great one of the things in New Day that we think about a lot is the long tail of distribution. In other words, it's not just about the broadcast and the festivals, but like how does the film continue to do its work year after year after year? And some of that is about um, you know, additional resources. Um, so I wanted to put a link to our site and I don't know, you guys should do that too if you have a study guide or additional resources about DID that are available. And then we also um, have a very active Facebook page for Unstuck. And um, then within that, there's a private group. So people who want to really share like intimate details of what's going on, do that in the private closed group. Um, so I think, you know, there's ways that the film just becomes a springboard for community to form and for people to meet one another and to share resources and so on. So I think um, another thing I wanted to mention that we did was asking people where the biggest problems were. It turned out when we were showing the film, with audiences, parents would often talk about how their kids would get punished at school for doing OCD rituals, and that the social workers and the teachers didn't, they didn't really understand a lot of times what was going on. And so we thought that the film could make a good intervention there. And so we um, pitched the film to different conferences, and I ended up traveling to a conference of the uh, School Social Workers Association and doing a screening there and a panel with uh, a therapist. Um, to just talk to those people who are actually in the schools dealing with this um, to try to just kind of set a better level of basic understanding um, and kind of best practices for how you then sort of deal with the situation because that's really a lot of times where it, this will present itself. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, just finding those audiences over time, I think is something that we've learned, all of us in New Day. Um, that's why I, I really like this whole series, actually. It's like building the audience beyond filmmakers. Yeah, somebody asked, um, can we talk through the process of creating study guides, Facebooks? Do you, yeah, why don't, can you talk about your, um, either social media or websites or study guides? I mean, we created our study guide with the help of a, a psychologist um, who helped us. Uh, it, a lot of terms and definitions and, you know, frequently asked questions and stuff like that. Yes, I mean, we did too, and it's on um, New Day page. There is a um, download button in, uh, you have to scroll a little, but it's available for all the study guide. And do you have social media as well? Yes, Busy Inside on Facebook, we have an active page um, and where you can see some Q&As with our characters too and uh, from the festivals where the film went. I mean, clearly, you know, there is a role for film within these mental health conversations because a lot of the mental health organizations have created film festivals. Um, uh, NAMI has a film festival. I know there's someone from NAMI here. Um, so yeah, there's quite a few um, psychologically themed film festivals. We also were in the Real Abilities Festival, which people don't often think of mental health as being related to disability, but um, and we found there were great audiences in Real Abilities, which is a, a wonderful festival. It travels. Um, you get lots and lots of audiences there. Yes, we will share links and resources mentioned. Yes. And all of these things are linked from our um, New Day Films pages as well. And all the films are available on Canopy as well. Uh, we are going to open up for more questions. I know we had another question from somebody, um, but before we get to that question, and please, if you have questions, please drop them in the chat and we'll get them. Um, I did want to tell you about a couple of upcoming things that we have going on here at New Day and a little bit more about the film since we were mentioning about um, some of these resources. We have a little bit. Um, if we go to our social media on follow our upcoming events for Reframe and Refresh, um, also some of our new releases with our films. Um, our Facebook and Twitter um, are at New Day Films, and um, our Instagram is at New Day Doc Films. We also have a variety of ways um, of streaming our collection. Um, you are meeting some of our filmmakers here today. Um, we offer Life of File license for, for most of our films in perpetuity, um, but we also have licenses um, that are one to three year licenses. Um, here's our website and we actually have different categories. There's one that's actually for psychology and social work that you can see kind of our whole collection of films that touch on a variety of subjects. And I think that's the one thing as we're kind of even hearing in this discussion, like mental health is a very broad umbrella. There's a lot of different aspects. Um, and, you know, we have some exciting announcements about their films that we wanted to share as well. Um, first off, um, their films are available on, um, on our website new day films for licensing um and busy inside and unstuck are currently available on canopy and a big announcement for rosewater kimi's film it is going to be available february 8th um, on canopy for both university and libraries um, so you'll be able to access if you have canopy um, to watch it there so we're really excited and i know somebody here was from america reframed as well another big announcement we have is that busy inside will be doing an encore broadcast on world channel on america reframed march 17th 8 p.m um, mark your calendars um, another thing that i wanted to just quickly mention is if you are a filmmaker out there um, and you're interested in learning more about how to join us. These are our lovely uh, member owners uh, that are part of our co-op, uh, New Day Films. Our next orientation, orientation for uh, informational webinar is February 23rd at 3 p.m. Um, you can go to our website, um, newday.com. Um, we want to come back to some of our Q&A. Um, somebody asked, um, I haven't seen any of the films yet, but I'm interested to see and or hear from the filmmakers about the techniques they used to help the audience see things through their subject's eyes, so to speak. Uh, you know, I can start answering it. Um, it was very, very uh, challenging maybe the most challenging part for me as a director because first of all when we started making the film we had many many different ideas of how to represent the scattered mind um, how to uh, make it visual and we um, decided not to go with most of the 
different techniques and forms that we came up with. We even had a shoot where we had a conversation between a few different personalities at one table. It was possible to do because our main character was able to switch on demand between different personalities. So we could actually stage a conversation, but we also decided not to use it in the film. It was maybe the hardest decision, but I think it was right because uh, the more directorial heavy, um, heavy handed um, formalistic things we used, although I really love doing these kind of things, the less material itself spoke to us. And we thought that with this film, we really have to just listen to a material, material and let it breathe and let it be on the screen and just let these people be on the screen. Um, because it's intense by itself, you know, it's, it's intense enough. And when you add um, a layer of how you see it as a director, I felt that it's just not working as well and um, that it takes away from, from the things we can witness with just our bare eyes. Uh, so the film itself became pretty straightforward in form. Um, and at the end, I thought it was the only right decision here. Kimmy, you wanna? Yeah, wanna? I, I can say, um, you know, my film sort of, uh, came to be in a much more like collage like fashion. So for example, even in terms of the starting point, the starting point in my film is I met someone on a train and had a conversation with them and they ended up sending me a dozen long stem red roses, you know, and that's actually how my film started because I was like, wow, I don't think I'm ever going to get long stem roses again. So I should make a film about it. And then I've always been, you know, very interested in creating uh, nuanced um, representations of Asians and Asian Americans on screen. And I thought, okay, I have these two different elements and let's kind of dive into the inner, you know, uh, world of this, this character. And I had a friend who was an actor who I really was drawn to his like melancholic, um, sort of restrained, but soulful quality. And so the, the film is shaped very much around that. And it's shaped very much around different landscapes that I had access to and locations and textures and basements and this and that. So it's kind of, it, you know, the approach is, it, it, it was not pre-planned at all. It was a much more kind of collage, like, you know, assemblage of things that then I think ends up reflecting, um, you know, again, the sort of associative subconscious uh, way of thinking, the perspective of the of the character, where you are diving so much into these kind of uh, dreamscapes and everything that don't have they have their own kind of internal logic, but they're also very surreal and strange, you know. So, um, yeah, I'm kind of coming to it from a, a little bit of a different uh, from a different perspective. We use the kids' drawings. Actually, we had thought also we would do animation, and then it just felt like simple is better. Um, but we did use, yeah, we did work with their drawings as a way to kind of get into their heads. Mm -hmm. um, people want to know about uh, the Russian release. Yes. Uh, you know, it started from the Moscow International Film Festival uh, where it premiered. Um, it just so happened. It happened that uh, when we finished the film was the closest uh, festival in the calendar and we are from Moscow, Russia, so the festival welcomed us very warmly. But uh, I must say that when we released the film there, we were a little bit nervous because Karen, the main character, was there and we, wasn't, we were not sure how she, uh, you know, how people are going to react to her. And she was there during the Q&As and during big press conference. Uh, with her, like her different personalities, and uh, she was very, very um, happy because not only uh, people loved her, but and really had incredible questions. And there is a very thoughtful audience at the festival. Um, but also, her book was translated into Russian and is gonna soon 
be at the market there, which at the book, uh, you know, available in Russian, which um, is an incredible, uh, not at all anticipated outcome. Uh, I would never think it would happen. But then in terms of theatrical release, we, um, again, it just basically happened because, you know, we, we I think, are from there and know uh, the company that's released it, released my previous film. And um, in terms of the interest um, the audience has had in it, it's hard to say. I think in general, the you know theatrical release for a film in America as well, everywhere in the world is a hard thing to do. But there it's even more a rare thing because the documentary market is just rising. It's not that developed. And I think there are just not that many titles that are uh, that you're competing with, maybe. And uh, once something caught your eye, it's uh, caught, caught you know the distributor's eye. It's uh, maybe that that what that's why it was like this. We're three minutes from from three o'clock on the East Coast, so it's probably a good time to wrap it up, uh, Larissa. Thank you, everyone who has joined us here today. Um, as mentioned, all the different resources that were shared in the chat or even maybe spoken, uh, we will share with you in a follow-up email. Just a reminder um, that we are gonna be actually partnering with the DC Environmental Film Festival. Um, it's gonna be the 30th anniversary celebrating next month um, for our next Reframe and Refresh with a conversation uh, on environmental um, films. And of course, that's very relevant as well um, as we're dealing with all this uh, issues of climate change um, and, in, and impact in the environment. So we really hope you'll join us um, for that next month and we will be emailing you more information as we get those details down. Um, but once again, um, feel free to go to our New Day website, newday.com um, to learn more about our films or about um, the filmmakers. Um, and uh, feel free to throw up an emoji <laughs> and, or a, a comment in the a chat to thank Thank our, our guests once again, um, and thank you all for attending, and hope you have a wonderful rest of the week.